so we've long wondered what would happen if interest rates hit the zero bound. Uh, and now we know the answer. Basically, nothing. <laughs> now, that, that's a surprising answer uh, because our theories predicted big events. Uh, old Keynesian adaptive expectations models predicted that a deflation spiral would break out at the zero bound. Uh, the zero bound is like an interest rate peg, unstable. It's like the ball on the seal's nose. Uh, the Taylor rule usually fixes that instability. If the Fed moves interest rates more than one for one with inflation, the same way the seal moves his nose under the ball, then the Fed can stabilize inflation. But when the interest rate can't move anymore, as happens at the zero bound, then the inflation or deflation spirals away and the ball falls off the seal's nose. Uh, here's a more serious uh, illustration. This is a uh, simple adaptive expectations model. Uh, there's a static IS curve at the bottom, a Phillips curve, and a Taylor rule with a zero bound constraint. So when, when you hit this with an IS shock, that's VR, the inflation in red starts to go down. Interest rates in blue start to go down faster following a Taylor rule to stop the disinflation. But then interest rates at zero and the deflation spirals uh, out of control. Uh, new Keynesian rational expectations models. Here inflation is stable at the zero bound. Uh, but new Keynesian models are indeterminate. Uh, the interest rate ties down expected inflation, but then actual inflation can add any arbitrary IID shock or sunspot. In these models, the Taylor rule or the Taylor principle picks one equilibrium. But when the Taylor principle can't work at the zero bound, uh, new Keynesian models predict that you'll have sunspots, multiple self-confirming equilibria, and inflation becomes more volatile. This is a core prediction of new Keynesian thought. Uh, Clarida Galleon Gertler wrote perhaps the most important empirical paper in this literature. Inflation in the 1970s was volatile because passive policy led to self-confirming volatility. Inflation became quiet in the 1980s because of active policy. For 20 years, a vast uh, New Keynesian liquidity trap literature has predicted that the zero bound would generate sunspot volatility. So if you throw away the prediction that passive policy leads to volatility, you have to throw away the theory's central empirical success and, and 20 years of its work as well. Monetarism, uh, I represented it here by Milton Friedman's license plate, MV equals PY, uh, remains surprisingly strong in commentary, though it's mostly vanished in academia. In this view, the zero bound is not really relevant, but raising the monetary base by three trillion dollars should cause uh, a hyperinflation. But there was no spiral, there was no volatility, and there was no hyperinflation. Inflation has the same pattern in this business cycle, that's in red, than it did in the last one. If anything, inflation is slightly less volatile now. QE, uh, illustrated by reserves in black, had no visible effect on inflation. Uh, here's unemployment GDP. GDP growth may be too low, but if it's anything less volatile than before. Unemployment came down, if anything, a little quicker than before. There's nothing here to suggest that the zero bound introduces more volatility or it's an important state variable for economic dynamics at all. Japan, Japan's been at it for 20 years. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> it would have been quite sensible in 2001 to think that we were starting a deflation spiral, but then nothing happened. Europe shows the same pattern, and intriguingly, even lower interest rates corresponding to even lower inflation now. So in sum, We've learned that inflation can be stable and quiet at a persistent zero bound, and that huge excess reserves paying market interest aren't inflationary. It's a pretty clear implication. The theories that predicted big events at the zero bound are wrong. Like the famous Michelson-Morley experiment, which showed that the speed of light is the same in all directions, despite the Earth's motion, quiet in the face of strong predictions is a telling experiment. Fortunately, we already have another theory. If you add the fiscal theory of the price level to the rational expectations new Keynesian model, you get a theory in which inflation can be stable, now determinate and hence quiet at the zero bound, and in which arbitrary open market operations can be irrelevant. Let me show you how. I start with the, the 
fiscal theory equation stating that the real value of nominal debt is the present value of primary surpluses. Second equation, move the dates forward one period, multiply and divide by PT and take innovations. Now you get the, that equation. Unexpected inflation corresponds to revisions in the present value of future primary surpluses. So, so for example, suppose that there's an unexpected deflation. Well now nominal debt is worth more. That can only happen if people expect higher surpluses to pay off that unexpected gift to bondholders. If they don't, then people try to get rid of overvalued government bonds. That raises aggregate demand and, and it reverses the deflation. So you see, the fiscal theory can solve the indeterminacy problem of new Keynesian models. It disallows the old Keynesian spiral and it can determine the price level independently of the split of government debt between bonds and reserves. It's the only pre-existing simple economic theory consistent with the quiet zero bound. A and we don't have to have, I'm sort of previewing Larry here, a big fiscal theory debate to use this result. These equations hold in every single model. If there's no change in long-term fiscal expectations, whether achieved actively, passively, endogenously, exogenously, or whatever, there can't be an unexpected inflation or, or deflation. Now, as you may have noticed, the paper is really long. <laughs> it's long to answer about half of the questions and objections I'm sure you have already. And, and this slide is deliberately, illegibly dense to give you a sense. But let me just give you a sampling. Um, maybe the economy really is unstable after all, but the Fed skillfully offset the deflationary spiral with hyperinflationary quantitative easing. Maybe expected future active policy can cut off multiple equilibria in a way that it didn't in the 1970s. Maybe nobody expected the zero bound to last, so Taylor principle selection, it was still working all along. Maybe we can modify the theories so that stability at the zero bound doesn't imply stability at an interest rate peg, and so on and so on. I answer most of these, but the main point is these are all possible but complex ex post patches and they start to look a lot like epicycles and ether drift. And here comes my second author, Occam. Maybe it's time to take Occam's advice and just use the really simple answer sitting uh, on the plate before us. You also likely have objections to the fiscal theory. What about Japan? What about the 1950s? What about the 70s and the 80s? Why are fiscal expectations so stable right now? The paper addresses many of these as well, but again, the main point I only claim that fiscal theory and New Keynesian model is possible, that it can account for this quiet zero bound in a way that the existing theories really can't. I don't claim it's proved, no theory is ever proved, and I certainly don't claim that it accounts for every other period in history as well. Now, second point, if inflation really is stable, an uncomfortable implication follows. It means that raising interest rates must eventually raise inflation as I show you in the left-hand graph. This is the third, my third author, Fisher. Uh, it's a form of long-run neutrality under interest rate targets. But it's still possible that raising interest rates could temporarily lower inflation, as I show you in the bottom right. So is there a simple, modern, economic model, all the adjectives matter, that produces a temporary decline in inflation on the way to the, to the eventual long-run rise? Let me start with the frictionless model. Here I have a rational expectations Fisher equation and fiscal policy indexes uh, inflation innovations. Now, pretty much the defining feature of the Fed and monetary policy is they cannot change fiscal policy. So I'm gonna call monetary policy a change in interest rates with no change in fiscal policy. And if we do that, that kind of interest rate rise, this is the green line here, all it does is increases inflation one period later in red with no temporary negative effect. The purple lines combine a fiscal policy shock with the interest rate rise. A fiscal shock, again, can give you a one-shot unexpected inflation or deflation. So a joint monetary fiscal contraction can give you a negative inflation on the day the policy is announced, followed by inflation induced by the higher interest rates. That could well account for a lot of observations, VARs, and episodes, but it still means that monetary policy alone will just raise interest rates. It'll have the same effect. Well, duh, you say. Obviously, we need to add ingredients. The world isn't frictionless. How about sticky prices? 
Then higher nominal rates mean higher real rates. That lowers aggregate demand. That could temporarily low inflation, right? I hoped so too. This was supposed to be a positive paper. Wrong, it turns out. Uh, here I have an interest rate rise, again in green, with no fiscal change in the standard new Keynesian uh, model. We'll set out, I put the equation at the bottom. Sticky prices just smooth out the inflation rise, and we still have no temporary decline. This result is deeper than pegs and passive policy. Here are solutions to the standard three equation model with active monetary policy, straight out of Woodford's book. In the bottom right hand corner, you see the standard result. If there's a transitory monetary policy shock, interest rates go down and inflation goes up. But in the top row, especially the top left, inflation and interest rates go up together when there's a persistent monetary policy shock. The standard active money equilibrium choice is even more fisherian than the no change in fiscal policy e equilibrium choice, that one from my last slide. It just goes up immediately. Now let me show you a modification that does work. Uh, go back to the frictionless case, but add long-term debt to the fiscal theory part. Now a persistent rise in interest rates lowers long-term bond prices, Q in the equation. B is predetermined. S doesn't change by assumption, that's what monetary policy is. So the price level P must jump down on the left-hand side. Higher interest rates still mean higher inflation, as before, but now you get a, a one-period price level drop. You get the temporary deflation that we've been looking for. Bond prices are driven by expected future interest rates, so it's the forward guidance part that matters, not the current interest rate. And so here I graphed an interest rate rise announced three periods in advance uh, to show you that point uh, as well. Now this isn't our goal, this is a frictionless model. Our goal is to mix fiscal theory and sticky prices. So here I plotted the effects of an unexpected interest rate rise with sticky prices, again no fiscal shock, and long-term debt now. And I calibrated the maturity structure uh, to match US data. There's way too many lines on this graph because they make a lot of points in the paper. But for now, just look at the solid red line which shows you the path of inflation. 1% higher interest rates leads to 1%, 1.5% lower inflation, and that eventually uh, melts away. Lots more in the paper on this model. But is this the answer? In its favor, this mechanism unites quantitative easing, forward guidance, and interest rate policy. The paper describes the quantitative easing uh, effect. I'll, I'll spare you a slide of equations on it. And it doesn't need any monetary frictions or pricing frictions to do it. However, it only works if and when the Fed surprises markets. So like Lucas non-neutrality, you can't use it for systematic policy. And persistently higher rates eventually mean higher, not lower inflation. So it could be a story for the 1970s that on its own, not the conventional view of the 1980s. You need joint monetary fiscal policy for that. Most of all, this is absolutely nothing like any story you ever told to undergraduates or FOMC members about why higher interest rates might lower inflation. So it's the answer, but not the answer to every question. Now here too, the paper goes on and on. To suggest that no other simple economic models give the desired result, I have to <coughs> survey a lot of models. You might say, oh, just add money. It turns out that can't quantitatively explain the past, and it certainly can't work for the question at hand, how is it, it going to work going forward with abundant interest-paying excess reserves? The paper goes on to, to, to address your natural question, what about more ingredients? You're, you're certainly itching to add ingredients. And again, I listed a, a long uh, set of possibilities on the slide that I won't read to you. But our objective is to find the minimum necessary, not just the sufficient conditions. If a quiet zero bound or a negative sign requires a big, big black, big back, uh, big black box friction, <laughs> for people to act irrational, irrationally or specific novel and complex alternatives to rational expectations, then we agree there is no simple model economic model, modern economic model, teachable to undergraduates, explainable to FOMC members that generates the classic belief. So that conclusion should at least reduce our confidence in, in the effect. And if we were honest, we should do that publicly. Imagine the Fed Chair's congressional testimony that starts Raising interest rates to lower inflation, it rests fundamentally on people acting stupidly and us exploiting that. Or, well, sorry, Congress people, there's no story I can tell you about why without a lot of equations and frictions 
about why raising interest rates lowers inflation. Hmm. Now, yeah, here, I, I absolutely do not argue that we should stop with simple models or frictionless models. There are pricing frictions, monetary frictions, real and financial frictions. Just like regular economics, we should and we, we now can start with basic frictionless supply and demand to get the general signs and stability right, and then add frictions uh, to understand magnitudes and, and dynamics. So summary, the evidence and simple theory suggest that inflation can be stable and quiet at the zero bound and therefore under a peg or passive policy. And that large interest paying reserves are not inflationary, even though these statements overturn longstanding contrary doctrines. Stability implies that persistently higher rates mean eventually higher inflation and your faith in a stable, exploitable, negative short run relationship, I hope is at least a little weakened. So let me draw some, some obvious policy implications. Most of all, we should get over an inordinate fear of the zero bound and the large balance sheet. We can, if we want to, live the Friedman rule. Perpetually low nominal rates and liquidity satiation in interest bearing reserves. There is no need to keep bonds artificially illiquid in order to have price level control. Another longstanding doctrine bites the dust. The optimal quantity of money is a lot. That was supposed to be a joke. <laughs> the, the constant interest rate peg, however, that's not necessarily optimal. If you have a, a constant low rate, that means that variations in the real rate have to be accommodated by endogenous variation in inflation and therefore possibly output. The Fed can well also adjust nominal interest rates corresponding to its idea of the natural real rate and that would stabilize inflation and with sticky prices output as well. If like me you're dubious about the Fed's ability to divine the natural rate, stability opens another option. The Fed could target inflation expectations directly by targeting the spread between indexed and non-indexed debt and let the level of the real raise rise and fall by market forces. Or the Fed can still diagnose and offset all sorts of shocks, try to fine tune dynamics with a complex DSG model as well. The old argument that fi about fine tuning, discretion versus simple rules, that really isn't about long run stability and, and neutrality and, and can go on. There's the old argument about what the Fed should do too. That's also supposed to be a joke. So observed monetary policy need not change that, that much from a Taylorish rule following output and inflation with temporary responses to other shocks. At most, the possibility of a peg makes the case for leaving things alone to settle down on their own a little bit stronger. The lesson is more about foundations, how we think about policy structure, price level determination, anchoring, grand strategy, how to avoid and combat another inflation, and the long run, choice of long run targets uh, and balance sheet. So I close here, and yes, I am closing, <laughs> with two warnings. This line of work is already cited in Turkey and Brazil to suggest that countries with high inflation can just easily and painlessly lower interest rates despite poor fiscal policies. No, <laughs> that conclusion does not follow. To lower inflation, the interest rate change has to be very long lasting, credible, and must come with fiscal backing. All of the historically successful disinflations that combined lower interest rates with lower inflation combined fiscal and monetary reform. Many attempted interest rate pegs failed from a lack of fiscal balancing. Our flight to government debt came before and not after our, our lower interest rates. Second, the fiscal perspective recognizes that anchoring quiet inflation comes from a stable real value of the government debt. That stable real value must come from a belief in abundant future surpluses or from a low discount rate. Right now, the low discount rate seems like the much more plausible option. But low discount rates can change quickly. And a small loss of faith in surpluses can be amplified by a higher discount rate. That's what happened in Greece. So inflation anchoring could vanish quickly and apparently mysteriously, having nothing to do with central bank actions, and then no quantitative easing or, or other intervention would stop it. Thank you. <laughs>